Today's Substance Abuse Summit is another step forward to help shine a light on this epidemic and to bring together a panel of speakers to share their experiences in the fight against substance abuse, share their struggles, recognize their accomplishments, and identify ways that we, as a state and as a community, can continue our efforts to create a brighter future for our state and for our residents. Through our collective efforts, we have come a long way, but there's still a lot more work to be done. Through the years, substance abuse has become one of the largest issues we face here in the Mountain State, affecting our homes, our schools, and our communities, and it must be stopped. Whether we have personally experienced a family member battle and addiction, or watched as a friend or a neighbor struggled on the path toward recovery, all of us have been touched by this heartbreaking epidemic in one way or another. The Governor's Advisory Council on Substance Abuse, as Governor Tomlin stated, it is the governing body that's designated to work collaboratively, and I think that's a very important word, to work collaboratively, to provide guidance regarding the implementation of not only our statewide strategic action plan for substance abuse, but to make recommendations for service provision, education, policy, and legislation concerning substance abuse initiatives. And he asked us to do so, and this was probably one of the most important things that he asked us to do, and that was to, when you're looking at these recommendations, only look at the recommendations after you take into consider consideration what the communities are telling us, because as you very well know, and this is probably one of the areas that we can say this most about, um, no two regions of the state are the same. Well, what's going on in one region of the state isn't going on in another region of the state. The solutions for this region of the state is not necessarily the solutions for another region of the state. And so we have to act differently. We have to be flexible. And we have to look at initiatives from the grassroots level up and we have to develop these public-private partnerships that not only enable us to develop the programs and services that are needed in your particular area, but we have to be able to work together to sustain those programs. The governor has uh, asked me to talk to y'all about our personal experience uh, in our, the Copenhaver family, and I want to start off with that, and then I would like to go into um, some things of the county council and. The, with the help of the governor's staff uh, where we're heading. But um, I asked the IT director, Gary Wine, to assist me. We brought in some pictures of our wonderful son. And I'm the only one here standing in front of you today, but he's going to tap me on my shoulder when I lose my composure. Douglas um, uh, was, was uh, our son, um, born in 1989. And uh, this is a picture of him. Uh, at a wedding reception trying to play around with his uh, cousin and wanted to dress up a little bit. And the whole point of talking about this today is he was the perfect child. He was the one that woke up in the mornings and worried about is he going to be able to pass with a hundred on his spelling test. He was very, very kind, loving, loved children. and. Um, Towards the end of his life, I kind of worried about the direction he was going and what people would think about him. But I think God answered that when there was 800 and some people at his, at his funeral service and uh, told me uh, and his mother and his sister what a wonderful young man he was. His first experience was alcohol at, at a young age. Um, and uh, his mother and I decided to send him in a, a place down in Winchester for alcohol treatment and a couple months before he passed he uh, he told me that uh, that's where he got his ex his knowledge on opiates so when we get into the recovery centers these people that that are going to be doing the treatment side and doing the counseling side I only beg you to be there for the for the right reasons be passionate about trying to get these people clean and off the streets and not not allowing them to get further educated our son never committed a crime, never stole a penny off of us. So I ask you to move forward in the direction that the governor has paved to help the citizens of Berkeley County, which I can assure you, if you're, you don't know of anybody that has a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction in your room, you will still benefit. 
Now, our fight against substance abuse must be fought from a number of angles, and that includes a mix of community programs, services, and efforts at the local level, as well as statewide reforms to help those struggling gain access to the resources they need, which is what Doug is talking about. During my time as governor, I have introduced a number of bills to increase and enhance these efforts, and I'm grateful for the overwhelming bipartisan support. Back in 2012, the, the governor led the way uh, with Senate Bill 437, and that was to deal with reform in how we looked at some of the specific problems that were happening in the state, particularly with pill mills, and particularly with folks getting access to the drugs that they could make other drugs with, including meth. Um, it, it put methamphetamines and track prescriptions into the MPLEX system. And uh, as we've already heard, 11 pill mills across the state of West Virginia have been shut down. And we've made this state a lot less welcoming for those who would abuse the process, while at the same time making sure that those who need the right treatment can get it. In 2013, um, the legislature agreed with the landmark legislation from the governor and passed justice reinvestment. This is a program that we're only now starting to really see, see come into effect across the state. How do we take the funds that we're using to incarcerate people, as you were just talking about, how do we take those funds at the end and move them to the beginning? How do we use data and evidence to make sure that the people who are most likely to reoffend get a different kind of treatment? How do we make sure that people who need substance abuse help get that in their communities rather than sending them off to a place where they're not going to get any treatment. The added benefit, hopefully, is that we're going to incarcerate less people in prisons and deal with local problems in a local way. The Justice Reinvestment Act serves a dual purpose in our fight against substance abuse. It gives offenders access to the resources they need to rebuild their lives and provides community-based treatment to those who need it to keep them on the right path. Before William started the program, he was he was he was just out on his own. Um, very um, how can I say, very distant. Um, didn't want to be around the family. Um, I would ask him, William, are you doing drugs? And he was like, No. Which I wanted to believe him, but in all honesty, in the back of my mind, I knew it was a lie. But I just didn't think that my child would be the child that would do drugs. And I thought that um, I've always taught William to be a leader, not a follower. Um, you know, you're going to make something of your life. Well, all that came to reality when William had offered a child in our neighborhood drugs, and this parent had came to my house. And right in front of my face, the lady was like, the lady, our neighbor said, your son offered my son drugs. And I wasn't home at the time, my, his stepfather was, and Will sit there and lied to his face and stated, I, I didn't do drugs, I'm not high. And Will was high as a kite. William um, got himself together, he made it to phase two. William started talking again, started laughing. Um, his grades started coming back up. Um, he was always a loner before because in my, when I was in school, we always called him burnouts. Well, he was no longer a burnout. He um, got back in, he's back in regular school now, did a 360 degree turnaround. We're now having family time. He's no longer beating up his um, brothers. He's no longer <laughs> causing family strife. He's no longer um, getting into alcohol. He's um, now on the basketball team, um, um, doing really good. Drug court has helped me change many in uh, many ways. My grades are really way better. I'm attending school many more, I mean much more. And um, I can finally say I'm doing the right thing for myself. And I'm looking at my future and I'm seeing that I can finally be somebody. Um, my thoughts on substance abuse are, it's not like you, you don't want, that's not the road that you want to go. Like. Um, 
like he said, his son was doing bad things and look at where he turned out. So I just, um, I want to thank you guys for having me and my mom. Um, I appreciate everything that the drug court, Judge Greenberg, Ms. Shannon, and um, Shauna Whiteman are doing for me. At this time, I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Sylvia Dikas. Uh, Dr. Dikas is a pharmacy practice resident at the VA Medical Center, Veterans Fair Medical Center, and in her line of work has seen the daily effects of prescription drug abuse. Dr. Dikas joins us today to speak about the use of Implex and how our prescription monitoring efforts have helped shut down pill mills and curb this epidemic. Pseudoephedrine is what's used to make methamphetamine, and for that reason, the both pharmacy and both the law enforcement likes to monitor who's getting it and how much they're getting. So, MPLEX, National Precursor Log Exchange, it's a service that, that allows law enforcement agencies and also pharmacies to track the sales of those medications. So the process typically goes like this. You need your government ID in order to purchase it. So you present either your state ID or your license or your passport. And then once that's scanned into the system, it sends a message to MPLEX saying how much you're getting and who's getting it. So federally mandated, there are maximums to how much pseudoephedrine you can get per day or per month. So the system tracks that and stops customers who are getting too much or who have reached that maximum. I've also led the charge against prescription drug companies that over, oversupply prescriptions and pay medications to our residents without proper prescription orders. And I remain committed to holding these companies accountable for their illegal and irrespon irresponsible practices. To continue our comprehensive substance abuse efforts, I've signed an executive order uh, in 2012 requiring Workforce West Virginia to mandate drug testing before providing services to those seeking employment. What had happened before, we were able through our workforce training program to send people, get them the training they needed to be ready for jobs. When they went out and uh, had to take a drug test, they could not qualify. So basically we've changed the way we're doing things. We're testing up front. If you're clean, We'll, we'll educate you and give you the kind of tools you need to uh, become employable. If not, we'll offer you the help you need to get clean if that's what you need to do. So, so you know, all these things are good and it's a good uh, objective, but, you know, at the same time, you know, don't forget that our budgets are thin too and has to be increased to meet this, this load, this workload. And it, it doesn't seem to be uh, going away or decreasing any. It, it's staying very steady. Uh, I'd love to see the uh, drug task force expand and, and get a little bit larger for the workload that they're handling. And again, the more you have, the more that you can come up with. And I think we're just kind of scratching the surface because it's in all parts of our lives, whether, you know, it affects you with uh, being burglarized or something stolen out of your car, which affects your insurance and which affects everybody's insurance, or whether it's a family member that needs help to get rid of this monkey on their back. So thank you, thank you, Governor, and everyone else that's working to get an end to this means. Now, it's important to have a variety of treatment options available, but sometimes what it really takes to get started on the road to recovery is a conversation with someone who understands your situation or has overcome similar struggles. So there's hope. There's hope here today. There's hope in this room. We've heard a lot of good things. Because there was hope for me when I was hopeless. And you know what, I, I, I am no one special. You know, I'm just someone that just happened to be in the right place at the right time, that I was willing to take this help from people. I've been able now, since I've been in recovery, to work in recovery communities in over 25 cities in the United States, 20 countries in the, in the world. I've, I've had that interaction with those recovery communities. I've seen what works. I've seen what doesn't work. You know, and I thank God every day that that I am a, a proud man in recovery, because if I'm not here to share with someone about what I went through and how I came through on the other end, there would be no help. There would be no hope because there was people there for me. I've been able to 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 get everything back in my life. Uh, I am now a, a proud member of a community. A, 
very, very proud uh, member of the city council, of our wonderful city of Martinsburg. And that would not have happened had I had not found recovery, if I had not stayed in recovery, if I had not been involved in recovery. So I've said time and time again, there's substance abuse affects so many West Virginians, and unfortunately, far too many of our state's children live in homes affected by this epidemic. In March, I was proud to join U.S. Attorney Booth Goodwin and representatives from the state police, DHHR, and the Department of Education to launch the Handle with Care program. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard about it, but it's an, an initiative designed to put our kids' safety and well-being first. Handle with Care offers a holistic approach that considers not only the physical safety, but also the mental health of children who have been removed from an unsafe environment. Very simply, uh, Officer Barney gets a report from one, any branch of law enforcement in Morgan County. He sends that to the school system, sends it to me, sends it to the principal. The principal then passes it on to the teacher, the bus driver, anyone who's going to be working with that child today. Um, there's no breach of, confident, of confidentiality. It just simply says handle with care. It has the child's name on it. And then we know as a staff that we need to be a little bit gentler with that kid today. There's probably a really good reason why he doesn't have his homework done or she's not ready to take a test if there was a, a warrant enforced in their house the night before. In addition to protecting students who are stuck in the middle of a family member struggle with substance abuse, we must also work to provide education about the negative impacts that substance abuse can have on their lives and on their futures. So we work with the kids, uh, they call for help, and after you do a class, you might get a student that comes up and tells you, hey, I've got a problem. And if they ask for help, we're going to find them some. And if they, uh, they might tell you about a family member. They might tell you about a friend. It doesn't matter as long as they come to us. So we're just trying to make sure that all law enforcement is portrayed in that view that we're not there to put them all in jail. Um, Everybody has said that there are some that need to be there, but there are some that just need put back on the right track, and that's what we're trying to do. Outside the classroom, we're also working to raise awareness about substance abuse and spread the message that if you or somebody you know is struggling, there is hope and there is help for you in West Virginia. This past September, we took a major step forward in our fight against substance abuse and launched the state's first ever, hi Tiffany, just noticed you back there, first ever substance abuse uh, call line. It's here at the bottom, 844-HELP-4WV. Now this new 24-hour call line provides referral support for those seeking recovery services. As many of us know, those struggling with addiction are often reluctant to take the first step and seek help. But now West Virginians all across the state have the opportunity to just talk with a professionally certified call line agent, discuss available treatment options, choose a path, and begin the road to recovery. So far, 844-HELP-4-WV has talked to more than 350 people in the last 45 to 60 days to connect them with the resources and treatment they need to get help and return, their, return to their families, communities, and workplaces. This time, I'm exceptionally pleased to introduce Jamie Moffat. <clears throat> Born and raised in West Virginia, Jamie started battling drug and alcohol abuse at a very early age. Determined to take her life back, she sought help at a long-term treatment facility for women and stands before us today, two years and nine months sober. Now, as a call line employee with First Choice, she's helping others who are struggling to find the help they need to begin the road to recovery. I, told, I was told that the acronym for HOPE was Hold On Pain Ends. Um, and, and that's kind of rang true to me. And the other word that kind of stuck out to me today was collaborative. This is a group effort. There is not one program, there is not one facility, um, one organization that can, that can fight this thing by themselves. We have to do this together um, as a group and as a team, um, which is why uh, some of what we're doing on the phone line is we're also doing a lot of community outreach. Um, we are going to, uh, my, my program director and I, we're going to the different homeless shelters, the drop-in centers, um, the drug courts and day reports, we're trying to communicate with them. We have some library events um, that, that we're trying to facilitate. 
uh, to meet these people where they are. Some people, they can't, they can't get on TV and, and see advertising or they don't listen to the radio um, or any of that. Or, you know, they're in a homeless shelter, they're here or there, um, or their, their mind is just so fogged that they can't focus long enough. Um, so we're going where they are. Over the past several years, we've come a long way in this fight against substance abuse, but there's still a lot more work to be done, and that's why it's so important that we continue to work together as state and federal leaders, as community members, county and local officials, medical professionals, service providers, teachers, law enforcement officers, and family members to find ways to provide those uh, who need the help they need to support to get back on their feet again, return to their families, their communities, and their workplaces, and lead happy, healthy lives here in West Virginia. So thank you all for coming today. And remember, if you, if your family member, your friends, your neighbors have a substance abuse problem here in West Virginia, there is hope and there's help for you in the state of West Virginia. Thank you all for coming today.